My name is Kelly Clark, and I've been invited by Basel to talk about uh, my new uh, book, Strangers, Neighbors, Friends, Muslim, Christian, Jewish Perspectives on Compassion and Peace. And I want to tell you a little bit about why uh, I wrote the book. And by the way, we're not just, I'm not just going to talk about the book. Um, he asked me to do a workshop, and uh, I think it's important to do what uh, gets said in the book. Um, and so there's going to be a, a sort of group activity here in just a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm a professional philosopher. I got my PhD at the University of Notre Dame in 1985. And if you're a professional philosopher, what you do uh, is that you write really abstract uh, ar articles that are arguments, and you try to get them to published in refereed academic journals, and then no one reads them. And uh, as I told the group uh, earlier today, I, I read a self-study of a journal. The average article in a philosophy journal is read by 1.43 people. And in my case, when you subtract my mom, uh, who at least glanced at all my articles, then you're down to 0.43 for uh, all, all of my articles. And uh, I wrote uh, over a period of about seven or eight years, I wrote about and published about 10 articles on tolerance. Uh, the virtue of tolerance, what it is, why it's good, why diversity is good, uh, all sorts of things people like. I, I would even be asked to write about it. I became well-known writing about tolerance. And by well-known, I mean maybe three people read uh, something that I wrote uh, at some time. And, um, and what I realized uh, after I turned age 50 was that I was really tired of just writing things that are abstract, that, n that no one really cares about. People care about tolerance. People don't care about academic articles on tolerance. They don't care what I, so, as some professional thing. I found even my own, own colleagues who, if I don't write them, you don't get promoted. If you don't publish articles, it's publish or perish. They don't even read what you write, unless they absolutely have to, like if they have to read something for you to get promoted or something. Nobody reads what academics write, you know, unless you're super famous and uh, have something um, really profound that no one's ever said before, and there's only about two of those you know, every generation. So, um, and also I just thought, uh, and I thought this because I had a, um, a Jewish friend, um, and he was my first close Jewish friend. And we were both, we're both Americans, and we were on sabbatical in St. Andrews in Scotland. And, uh, we befriended each other and uh, we take walks on the old course which is allegedly the home of golf uh, on the beach uh, and he had me at his house for a Shabbat service, a Sabbath meal and I'd never been inside um, a, a home uh, for a Sabbath meal and he just opened up his, I'd say he opened up his religion to me, he actually was an atheist. Every like I didn't know there were Jewish atheists so this was good you know the world just got bigger just I met a Jew, he turned out to be an atheist. The world uh, really expanded for me. His family was not, they were really pretty seriously orthodox and the service, the, the Shabbat order was really orthodox and to me it was like entering a foreign world. I, I'm a Protestant cr Christian, going to a Catholic church was like going to a foreign country for me. And here I am uh, having Shabbat and, and my world just got bigger. I, um, and I'll say something. So, uh, I'll say something about um, my biases. Jew Jews just weren't part of my world. I I had my views of Jews written by non-Jews, and they were usually written by Christians, like really conservative Christians. So I learned about Jews from non-Jews. I'm just going to tell you one thing: the worst way to learn about any group of people is by somebody who's not in that group, especially by somebody who's got an ax to grind with somebody in that group or thinks their group is superior to those uh, people in, in another group. The best way to learn about people who are from diff different from you is to ask them and to listen. That's the best way. Well, let's work our way up to that. I, I grew up conservative Christian uh, and I thought until I was, I don't know, 22 or 23, maybe 24, maybe 25, I don't know. I thought that only 
people who believed exactly what I believed were going to heaven and everyone else was evil. And uh, I already mentioned I went to the University of Notre Dame, which is a Catholic school, and I met all these Catholic people, which I thought were pretty nice, maybe nicer than I was, or maybe nicer than a lot of the Christians that, it, you know, and not Christians, like only Protestants or Christian Catholics are, uh, you know, sons of the devil or something. I didn't know what they were. And I, anyway, I met them. And uh, by the time I graduated from Notre Dame, I just could no longer think Catholics were going to, to hell. I just couldn't think it anymore. And I just, I thought, well, these Catholics are Christians too. And then, but then I thought, but them Muslims, you know, here was this other group that I could look, I could feel spiritually superior to and then look down on, on them Muslims. And so I still had this bias against Muslims. And I didn't meet a Muslim uh, until after 9-11. And um, meeting Muslims changed my whole view of Muslims. I now uh, work with Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And I work with my Muslim, Christian, and Jewish friends on compassion and peace. That's what I do. Uh, I try to do it in ways that gets out to the public. So what I mainly do is work with academics. I just finished a million dollar grant working with Muslims, Christians, and Jews from around the world. And they're, they're all professors or PhD students. So they're all, uh, and they were all young. Um, and, um, well, not all of them. I, I was in it too. Uh, uh, and a couple of older folks, but mainly they were um, like 25 to 35. And it's, it's at a time when people are still ripe for change. And I wanted to get to young academics um, for whom it's not, it's not a good to be involved in your community. It's not a good to be involved in things like uh, compassion and peace. Um, and I wanted to get to, to work with that group of people and uh, have them work together on an academic topic. So we, we worked on that, but we also uh, lived together for a week every year. We shared multi-faith rooms, Muslims shared with Jews, Jews shared with Christians. Um, and um, we just spent a lot of time getting to know one another and talking about how we can take what we learned into our classrooms and into our synagogue, our, our worship spaces, and also into our communities and work for justice and peace. That's the goal of what I do. Um, I wrote a book on liberty and tolerance that I thought was more um, practical. Uh, and as I mentioned before, Yale University Press published it. Uh, Abraham's Children was the name of the book. I had five Muslims and five Christians and five Jews write about uh, liberty and tolerance, but they had to write from their own faith perspectives. Um, I think a lot, of, um, a lot of academics who write about things like liberty and tolerance write from a white, western, liberal, academic, privileged perspective. And guess what? It doesn't appeal to everyone all over the world. It doesn't appeal to people who aren't white, uh, western, liberal, and actually mostly men. Um, most of the people that developed views of liberty and tolerance didn't really extend liberty and tolerance to things like I don't know, uh, Indians in the West. They weren't fully human, so it was okay not to tolerate them. It was okay to wipe them out. So, uh, if, uh, so then I thought, well, what does appeal to people? Uh, people, part of their identity isn't just to be sort of rational. That's the way Westerners like to look at it. Um, most of the people in the world that aren't academics are actually people in faith traditions. And faith tr traditions can really shape and move what people believe and how they act. So I asked people to speak from their own faith perspectives, to speak to people in their own traditions. And some of the essays in the book are outstanding. I mentioned before uh, Jimmy Carter, the former president of the United States, wrote for it. Um, he nods his head because he knows, because I told people about it this morning. No one knows about it for any other reason because no one bought the book. Um, Again, except my mom, she bought multiple copies, so uh, we went way beyond 1.43, I think into double figures, like 12, 13 copies <laughs> sold. Uh, and uh, the former president of Indonesia wrote for the book, Abdurrahman Wahid, the first democratically elected president um, in Indonesia wrote for it. Really terrific piece, and he is a pioneer in Indonesia, or was a pioneer, he's passed away. In fact, he passed away after he agreed to write, uh, which I thought was really 
rude on his part. Uh, he agreed to write, then he passed away, and then I had to, uh, it turned out to be a hassle to get his contribution. Dead people don't write as well as you might think. Uh, but I got it. I got his contribution, and it's fantastic. Um, but no one bought the book. And, and maybe you've noticed I wrote the book, Abraham's Children, um, Abrahamic Reflections on Liberty and Tolerance, and, and peace didn't break out in the world. Uh, in fact, in the past, I'd say five or six years, things have got, gotten demonstrably worse. And not only have they gotten worse, they've gotten worse in the United States. Um, and, and things people used to keep on the inside, I, I, I'm not going to make this a big political thing, but I, I, I will say that Trump has allowed people, for things that used to be on the inside, they come out now. People can say them. I think everyone's biased, everyone's bigoted, everyone's a racist, everyone. I think everyone is. And I'll, I'll try to explain why in a little bit. Um, but what we have to learn is not to act on that. And um, in the last four, four years, it's been okay to act on it. Uh, Islamophobia is on, a, on the rise, dramatically on the rise in the United States. Anti-Semitism is on the rise in the United States. Uh, Christians, it's not just the United States, Christians in Muslim majority countries are uh, persecuted. Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the world. And maybe until about three years ago, uh, since uh, a couple of million uh, Muslims in China have been put into concentration camps and been re-educated out of their Islam. So maybe Muslims have taken over the lead uh, because China was able to persecute so many people. So liberty and tolerance have not taken out in the world, or taken off in the world, and so I thought, uh, all right, let's try again. And I commissioned, or I asked a, a Muslim uh, one Muslim and one Jew to write with me one book on um, called Strangers, Neighbors, Friends, Muslim Christian Jewish Reflections on Compassion and Peace. I asked them to speak from their faith perspectives. I, I work in cognitive psychology along with philosophy. I've learned a lot about how our minds work. And one thing I've learned in the past 10 years is that people don't really respond to arguments. So I asked them not to argue. I asked them to tell stories. People. Um, uh, I, if I sit and listen to you and hear your story, I understand a lot more, but if you try to argue with me about something, I'm just, we tend to go like this and, and actually step, take a step back and get more extreme and more dogmatic. So um, we, we tell stories. Each chapter makes a theological point about compassion and peace. And we're speaking to people from our own traditions, that's our first audience, but we also think everyone around the world needs to be educated about each of the traditions. And so I said, but also write as though, uh, if you're a Muslim, that Christians and Jews are looking over your shoulder and reading those chapters and they're gonna learn about um, Islam. And if you're a Jew, uh, Christians and Muslims, let's see, I may have gotten this wrong already. I don't know, you got the point. People who aren't in your tradition are gonna learn about your tradition from what you write. Um, so there's a lot you can learn about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in these chapters. So, and you'll learn something different in each one, but you're gonna learn it mostly by people telling stories. Um, is Aziz Abu Sarah is my Muslim co-author. He has the most interesting stories. They're all about himself. He's way more interesting than I am. I read the story this morning, uh, the chapter this morning, where he talks about how when he was nine years old, uh, he's Palestinian. He grew up in Israel. Palestinians are not treated all that well in, in Israel. It's not a great place to grow up. Uh, and his um, one morning during Ramadan, he was sleeping. He shared a bed. There were four boys in the family. He shared a bed with the oldest brother, Taysir. And at four in the morning, the Israeli Defense Force, like a dozen men, busted in to the house, into their bedroom, and grabbed Taysir and took him away. They said just to ask him a few questions. They kept him away for eight months. Taysir was um, 19. They kept him for eight months, and um, when he came out, he had been tortured for nine months. And um, his family immediately took him to the hospital for surgery. He had a ruptured spleen. 
ruptured, ruptured pancreas, ru ruptured li uh, liver, and uh, he died a few days later. He was tortured to death by the Israeli Defense Force. And Aziz was 10 when his brother was tortured to death, and he became radicalized by it. And his chapters are his path away from rad radicalization and towards peace. And now he works with Jews for peace. Uh, if you want to read about him, A, buy the book, which is out there for sale. For students, it's only 10 bucks. Uh, if you want to buy it, as I noted before, uh, 10 bucks is the equivalent of two slices of pizza. And some of us probably could do with two fewer slices of pizza, or maybe have it right now. Maybe we should order some pizza. Uh, anyway, <laughs> just think, made out of, uh, you, you could eat my book, or you could buy it and eat it instead of two slices of pizza. <laughs> Uh, so it's 10 bucks for, for students. Um, you can read about Aziz's story. It's a remarkable story of, of what transformed him from radical to, um, to peace. Uh, today I'm going to talk mostly about my story, but I want to tell a little bit about what I think about um, why books like this need to be written and why people like you need to be fighting uh, against uh, bigotry and racism. Um, and uh, other sorts of biases that, that hurt other people. And I'm gonna give my, I'm gonna do it pretty quickly, but I'm gonna give my philosophy of why I think people really fight and why people are really different. Um, there's a longer version on the ISERM uh, website. I gave a talk on this a couple years ago, but I think it's important um, for students to, to get a sense of that, especially given the class that the you three students who actually didn't cut. Um, <laughs> Are, are taking, and then uh, why, how, why this book might, uh, how and why this book might have something to say to it. So this is the, um, as you can see, you can, I think you can have one of these too, where ISERM, the International Center for Ethnic, Ethno-Religious Mediation, uh, and so when ethno-religious people are in fights, and you do a quite a bit in uh, Nigeria, I take it, um, and, um, but when there are ethnic groups that are fighting or re uh, religious groups who are fighting, I, my, my view is this, and I teach a whole course on this. I, I, I have an article published on this in your journal, uh, which you can see, I, I don't make most of this up. It's, it's well established in the social sciences, and it's this. Uh, people seldom fight over religion, okay? People seldom fight over religion. Almost never is religion the primary motivation or the secondary or the tertiary motivation for why people fight. Um, this is probably the most controversial thing I'll say. I'm going to defend it here in just a little bit. Um, let me just give you an example. Today we heard somebody who said that Iran and Iraq, it was Sunnis versus Shias. But if you ask most Muslims, What's the difference between a Sunni and a Shia? Most Muslims have no idea whatsoever. Do any of you know what the difference between a Sunni and a Shia is? I can give a vague example. Uh, I can give a general outline, yeah. Well, you might, so, but I, you don't count. You're, you're, <laughs> he, like, knows things. <laughs> do, you, do any of you? It, I'll just, just quickly, it goes back to who is the proper successor of uh, oh, Muhammad. Muhammad. Uh, so the first century of Islam, it goes back 1,300 years. And you know what? Most Muslims, near as I can tell, don't really care a anymore. They don't know, like they're not fighting over who is the official successor of Muhammad. They do care about um, three different things. They care about uh, when they're attacked, they care about when their kin, their children especially are attacked, and they care about when their tribe is attacked. And when that happens, or, they, or when people fear that happening, then they fight back. Uh, the first one's the most obvious. Uh, if I feel threatened myself, I attack, or get ready to attack, or think about attacking. I just read a, a sad thing. Uh, a, um, a policeman, I, almost certain it's in Texas, somebody else can look it up, but it was just maybe two days ago, thought he had an intruder in his house, thought he was being attacked, and shot and killed his son. He didn't kill him because it was his son. He killed it because he felt he was under attack. 
Our, our most basic, our most animal instinct is to respond with fear if we feel like we're being attacked. And if we can defend ourselves, then we defend ourselves. Um, our, our immediate instinct when we fear attack is to fight or flee. So that's the first reason we might fight, if we ourselves feel attacked. And it's not hard to imagine why someone living with drones flying constantly overhead. Do you know the U.S. flies drones? Do you know the U.S. has a presence in 77 countries in the world? I don't know how many we fly. Maybe you know, maybe it's more even. At one time it was 77, which is a lot. And uh, we fly drones in I don't know how many countries. There's a, a really good documentary about drone wars. I recommend watching it. Drones fly above and, um, and they drop their, they can let their bombs go. And sometimes people will go, like the bombs will go and they'll, they'll blow up. And you know what, our bombs, we think we drop smart bombs. Our bombs aren't so smart. Bombs aren't smart. Um, and um, we've dropped them on gymnasiums. We drop them on hospitals. We drop them on innocent people all over the world. No one kills more innocent people around the world than Americans. And what we do is create fear. So in places where <laughs> drones fly constantly, children grow up with post-traumatic stress disorder. They live in fear. One time I was uh, at my house, my, the house uh, where my parents lived. I, it's on a lake. And right at the end of the lake, there's an airport. And uh, one of our big uh, jets, the one that you can't, radars can't see, you know that big black bomber jet that radars can't see? It, radars can't see it, but it makes a lot of noise. And it looks scary. And it was loud. And it flew over. It was terrifying to have it just fly over. Imagine if you lived in a country where it dropped bombs. Iraq, um, uh, Pakistan, um, um, Syria, Yemen. Uh, Yemen. Imagine living in countries where it, it creates fear and when people fear for their lives, they want to fight or flee. And if there's a disproportion of power, if you don't have one of those to fly back, you might strap a set of bombs around you and go blow it up somewhere. That's your, that might be your only power. Uh, part of my thesis is also that uh, suicide bombers are not crazy or irrational. It's totally rational if you live in fear to want to fight back. That's the first, attacks on self. Second, attacks on kin. Um, I think we're especially concerned. I, I remember one time I was skiing with my son when he, he's 26 now, but he was, maybe he was eight then, and I'm at the bottom of a ski slope and I'm sitting there on my skis and all of a sudden I see this, had to have been a teenager, pretty sure it was, skiing as fast as he could but out of control. And he was skiing so fast I saw that he was, if I didn't move I saw he was going to hit my son so I ski, I like I, I don't remember going backward or forward, I skied right in front of him to protect my son. I would have done any, if it had been a car I would have jumped in front of it. I would have done anything to protect my son. If my kin are attacked, are attacked I will fight back. And the, so I, I, I got right in front of him. He knocked me clean out of my skis. My, he knocked me out of my gloves. My glasses flew off. My hat flew off. That's how fast he was going. He could really have hurt my son. But my instinctive reaction was when my kin are attacked, I, I'm going to defend him. And... Um, I got up, I don't swear very much, I swear a little bit, but I got up and I said, and I just started yelling swear words at, like a sailor at this, this kid, and he just slunk away, you know. I didn't hit him, but oh, I, I, I was so class. I was so mad, and my son had never seen me like that. It sort of scared him. Um, but when your kin are attacked, we instinctively react uh, in defense. And when our kin are attacked, we usually want to fight or flee. And uh, imagine what we've done, uh, in, and, and I mean this about U.S., but anywhere. This is why people fight. When their kin are attacked, they fight back. Second reason. Third reason, when our tribes are attacked. 
Um, we all live in uh, people groups. Early humans lived in people groups of roughly 35 to 50 for their first 190,000 years of existence. From roughly 200,000 BC to roughly 10,000 BC when the agricultural revolution began, human beings lived in small, mostly extended kin groups of 35 to 50. Uh, they lived in tribes. Um, when groups got bigger, they were still tribe groups. There were groups with which you identified and um, with which um, uh, uh, you cooperated against other tribal groups. So early human beings, um, so you got, we have, I've, I've got my group. Let's take you, you have your group. Let's suppose that. Uh, let's take you. I'm, I'm going to tell you a difference here uh, about this. Uh, early human groups didn't look much different from each other. But early human beings had to know really quickly who was in their group and who wasn't in their group. I think this is the root of what we call tribalism. You had to know immediately who's in and who's out. In group are kin or extended kin. So they're like your big family. They're people who cooperate with you. They're people that you can trust. They're your family or your friends. Um, they're, uh, there might be a division of labor that you uh, have with them. Um, but in group is always good. Out group is always by definition bad. So suppose you're in the other group. And I'll tell you why I picked you and not you. Early, early human groups, skin color was roughly the same. So it's not as though um, we had black and white uh, fighting in early human groups. Early human groups, skin color was the same. So ours is roughly the same. And so uh, how did people tell who was in other groups? Well, one thing you might do is your group might have Maybe you put scars on. It's probably the roots of scarification. Why did people in groups put scars on their faces or very visible scars? Why do people do that? Well, I think it's so you would know just like that who's in your group. I mean, imagine if you didn't know just like that who's in your group. You'd be out, maybe you're by yourself looking for food, and I look over and I, I, I see you probably at a distance. We won't get this close, but at a distance. And... Um, I can't tell if you're out looking for a mate. I can't tell if you're out just looking for food. As for all I know, you're out looking for a mate and you want to steal somebody in my group uh, or rape somebody in my group or steal our food or kill me. Uh, people, have, people in group have to earn trust and they have it. People out group haven't earned it. And you had to decide quickly because if I didn't decide and I sat there thinking, hmm, I think I'm just going to reach out in love uh, to this unknown stranger and uh, invite him into my home and walk over. And by the time I'm over here, I've got a spear through my gut. Uh, early human groups were very territorial, very tribal. Um, they didn't easily share resources without groups. There was sharing. I don't mean there wasn't cooperation between groups. There, there was, but it was difficult. So you had to know right away, scarification. People wore clothes to identify who was in their group. People, uh, you can see photos of this in groups. People might put blue coloring on their face or blue coloring in their hair, or they might do something with their hair so their hair sticks up so you would know who was in your group. Uh, people who are apart from one another uh, but speak a language, maybe the same language, accents can be a way that you can tell who's in and who's out. There's an Old Testament story where their soldiers are at a bridge and they ask people to say a word and the word is shibboleth. And they ask them to say that word, I think, doesn't say why, I think because in group would pronounce it correctly, out group would not pronounce it correctly. And all it could take is just a little bit. And you know, some of you are from Bronx and some of you are from Manhattan, you can tell who's from Bronx and who's from Manhattan. I can't tell them. They all, you all sound like New Yorkers to me or whatever, but, uh, but you can tell. Uh, early humans were very sensitive to accents to tell who's in and who's out and to smell. I remember because people eat slightly different food in different groups. Uh, I remember uh, one time um, I, I went to China a lot and had a lot of relationships with people from China and um, 
And one time I picked a Chinese guy up who had been flying uh, and hadn't showered for a couple of days, so he sort of was oozing out Chinese food. And I picked him up. It's the middle of winter, and I'm, I got the car windows open because I thought he stunk. And um, about a year later, I had a Chinese student live in our house. And the Chinese student that lived in our house, we went away for the weekend. We came back in the middle of winter. I live in Michigan. It's, it snowed there today, to give you an idea what it's like. And we had a really cold winter, below, below zero many nights. We came back, and all the windows in the house were open in the middle of winter. We went away for Christmas. We came back. All the windows in the house were open. We have a whole house fan that sucks in the summer. It sucks cool air up from the ground and circulates it through the house. He had it on in the winter. He was bringing in zero degree air. And uh, so I said, Jackie, what's going on? We got, you got the furnace on and he had it in way high to keep the house warm. What are you doing? And he said, oh, oh, you know, I opened up the windows because your house stunk. See, uh, I thought he stunk. He thought I stunk. We're very sensitive to smells of different groups. It doesn't take much. Uh, you know, you eat slightly different food, you sweat a little bit differently, and you can tell who's in and, and who's out. Uh, people who are in your group smell, people who are out group stink. In group, friend, family, good, trust, cooperation. Out group, enemy, bad, st uh, stinky. Um, and, and again, we have to know this right away. And it turns out that... Um, what we have is a sort of inbuilt bias towards people who are in our group and against people who aren't in our group. And uh, again, people who are in our group are good, people who are out group bad. And then our cultures have to tell us who's in and who's out. We have to learn who's in and who's out. Uh, I didn't grow up uh, with prejudice against Muslims. I had to learn that. Someone had to tell me that. And here's the interesting and sad thing. Children learn it very early. They've done studies with um, psychological studies, do really cool studies with infants. And um, they already know that five-year-olds already have pretty, have already absorbed all the prejudices of their parents. They, they know this already. Uh, and then they want to, well, like, where does this start? Uh, it doesn't start in the womb. Um, making judgments about who's in and who's out and having to do that and to do it quickly and to do it without thinking, that happens. We know that. Everyone's got it. It's built in. But learning who's in and who's out, learning who's good and who's bad, starts already, they think, about six months. And they can do things with babies where they can see how long they gaze at different things. And sometimes they'll gaze longer when they're surprised. And, um, and, uh, or at things they don't like. There's a way they might stare at things that they don't like. And... Um, uh, and it shows up in their sense of justice. So they'll take the, pers the kind of person their parents are biased against and they'll show something where they do something bad and they're not punished. And they'll do something, the same thing with a person who's in their group and who's not punished. And it'll be okay for the person who's in their group not to be punished, but it won't be okay for the person who's not in their group not to be punished. So it's already wrapped up in their sense of, of fairness and justice, who's in and who's out. And um, so how do we learn who's in and who's out? Sadly, in America, most white people learn that black people are out. And, and they never meet somebody who's um, not in their group for a long time. Our, the way we're segregated is bad. And uh, I, when I was in high school, 1972, I think, when I started high school, it was the first year that we had um, Forced desegregation of high schools. So I went to almost all white middle school. When I went to high school, um, they bust in black children from the north side and white children from our side went over there. Before that, not the, the two never met. And it was hard. There were fights. There were riots. It was um, difficult when that happened. That was 1972. We forced desegregation. And then the whites fled. And now I think we have some of the worst segregated schools that we have ever had, economically segregated schools that we've ever had. It's horrible what's happened. It is, it, we didn't get better. Um, so um, 
how about, let's just take Muslims. Uh, how do we learn that they're bad? The, we, well, we have to get information about them. Most Americans don't know them. They did a, the, the Pew did a study with um, uh, Americans, and they found out that Jewish Americans, by and large, are not too bad with Muslims. Atheists aren't so bad with Muslims. Evangelical Christians are the worst, by far, the most biased against Muslims, by far, in the United States. They're also the most likely never to have met a Muslim. So where do they get their information? They get it from the news. And what do you read in the news? You read every time a Muslim, every time someone with olive colored skin and maybe uh, some kind of beard, every time they do something, and you know they're from Saudi Arabia or Iraq or ISIS or something, every time they do it, it's because they're Muslim. Every time a white person does something bad, it's because they're crazy. White people are excused. It's okay if a white person does something wrong, the six months old baby excuses. They don't have to be punished, it's okay. Uh, somebody out group does something wrong, they have to be punished, they're bad. They're, they did it because they're bad. So, here, and here's another interesting thing about this. Muslims in the US read bad things about Muslims. And so they've done surveys of young Muslims. Guess what? They have biases against Muslims. That's how powerful the media is right now. And it's more powerful than ever with uh, Facebook and Instagram because it makes us more in-group than before. Facebook knows, Facebook knows like this what group you're in. Uh, they know more about your group and you than you know. And they're going to give you information that confirms your biases and prejudices and then outgroup people, it's going to confirm their biases and prejudices as well. We, we live in as divided a time as I've ever seen in the United States. Um, so, I, so, this is why, so these are the three reasons I think people fight. One is when their self is attacked. The other is when their um, kin are attacked. And the last is when our tribe is attacked. And our tribe can be attacked in a lot of ways. Our tribe can be attacked when people want to take our land. We usually fight over land um, and, uh, or water. There's fights over land or water. And there'll be increasing fights over water. Um, there'll be fights, there are fights over oil. Uh, there's a lot of things tribes get invested in. There are a lot of things that contribute to a tribe's good. And so when a tribe is attacked, our natural instinct is to fight back. And here, here's what's interesting. We, also, we have a natural instinct to seek revenge and especially if we're in power. And so after 9-11, even though 15 of the 17, uh, I, I actually don't, I don't think any of the, um, of the people involved in the 9-11 attacks, I don't think any were from, from Iraq. 15 of the 17 were from Saudi Arabia. And for some reason, all Americans, God bless America, thought, yes, let's attack Iraq. We so wanted revenge. We didn't rationally, we should have attacked Saudi Arabia. 15 of 17 of the attackers were, were, I don't think we should have attacked anybody, by the way, but 15 or 17 of the attackers were from Saudi Arabia. We attacked the wrong country, but it didn't matter. When your tribe is attacked, uh, you want to get revenge. And, and we got revenge on the wrong country. So that, this is why we fight. Here's an easy way to identify the teams by their religion. That's the easy way. Um, so I'll, I, I said before, I, I think people seldom fight over religion. You can go back over all the, the great fights that you think were religion. Uh, Protestants and Catholics in Ireland. They, the Protestants and Catholics have no idea. They did not fight over the real presence of the host in the Lord's Supper. They didn't fight over uh, the priesthood of all believers, they couldn't probably have told you what the differences are between Protestants and Catholics. It was just an easy way to say who was on the British side, which wanted to retain colonial control over these people, and then um, and the Brits were, happened to be Protestants, and the Irish happened to be Catholics, the people that wanted autonomy. 
that wa wanted to make their own decisions, that wanted to control their own fate. That's what they fought over. And you can go through the list of things we've looked at. You can go through the Crusades and find out it wasn't Christians fighting Muslims, really. Um, and uh, any good historical book will tell you why people were really fighting. Um, and they, they don't fight primarily over religion. And yet, I think, uh, because the people in the fights often are religious, I think religion can be part of the solution. Uh, and it needs to be part of the solution because people are, are whole people. Uh, and you, need, you want to bring everything to bear when you're uh, involved in uh, mediation or conflict resolution or just making the world a better place, a place where people can flourish. Uh, religion can play a role in that. And so um, I ask my authors to write to people in their own traditions to motivate them to compassion and peace. I ask them mainly to write to young people. Uh, I'm going to give the three students who stayed, the three young people, um, I'm going to give you a copy of the book. You can take one with you because I, um, I don't care about profit. I care about peace. And um, I want you to be um, uh, people who make peace. And, and most of the people in this group already are. The people that are in ISERM or come to ISERM, they're all, they're all doing it. They're doing it all over the world. So I asked people to write from their perspectives. This, this afternoon I, I read something from my Muslim um, co-author, and then I read something from my Jewish co-author, but I didn't read anything from mine. Um, so I, I'm going to speak from my perspective. I'm a Christian, and I try to speak to Christians. Um, so here's a, here's, a, here's a story in the Bible, New Testament. A Canaanite woman from the region of Tyre and Sidon came to him, to Jesus, crying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He, Jesus, answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she, she said. And he, Jesus, replied, it's not right to take the, do the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. This is the most in-group, out-group story that I'm aware of in the entire New Testament. And uh, a lot of people try to put the words, the bad words, the in-group words, they try to put them in the mouth of the disciples. But Jesus is the one that says them. And I don't know if you caught it at the end. Jesus refers to this woman as a dog. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. This woman, uh, the, the story, she's often called the Syrophoenician woman, the, the woman, and here it says she's a Canaanite. The Canaanites were considered like dogs to both the Romans and to the, um, to the early Hebrews at the time. So they viewed her as a dog. Um, all the Canaanites were thought to be like dogs. They were rough, uncivilized. They were definitely not um, God-loved like the, the Jews. They, they probably weren't even God-liked. That's probably what, how people thought of them. And so it's a, the Canaanite woman. She's a woman. Women were second-class citizens. Uh, I don't know when this started, but... Uh, there was a prayer that many Jewish men would say in the morning uh, where they thank God that they weren't born a woman. Women are second-class citizens, and it was horrible back then. So she's a second-class woman, and as a Canaanite, she was a pagan. Uh, and pagan means not a worshiper of the true God. They all worshiped some God, um, but not the true God they didn't th think. So in, in that ancient context, they thought she wasn't worthy. She was thought she was unworthy of respect. And then she gave birth to what she called, what they called a demon-possessed child. We don't know what that is exactly, um, but this is the thing that people would have thought. It's the mother's fault. Like, what did the mother do? What was the mother's sin to have given birth to this? It's the mother's responsibility. So horrific sinner on top of being, uh, you know, a dog, a woman. You know, you ever go to the mall and you see a, a woman walk by with a baby, and the, or ch like an infant, um, say a two-year-old, toddler, and the baby's got food running down 
snot running down its nose, hair is messed up, food down there, the woman's yelling at, at the baby. You ever look at that woman and say, wow, she's a terrible, or think, she's, what a terrible mother. And anyone ever think that? Me neither. But the, <laughs> the point is we often attribute the behavior of the child to the parent. It's like the parent's fault. Uh, anyone who is a parent here, by the way, thought that a lot before they were parents, but then after your parents, you're like, oh, I get it. <laughs> uh, but before you're a parent, uh, you might think that. Anyway, it's sort of built into us to be judges of people. Uh, here's what we often do, by the way. I think sometimes we will often go to a place where there are lots of people. I did it last night in New York looking at people. But you sit down and you just watch people walk by and you say, oh man, what a weirdo to yourself. <laughs> or, ooh, I never wear my hair like that. Or, I never have a tattoo like that. I and then every person that goes by, it's like you figured out what's wrong with them. They're out, they're down. And you feel superior. Um, that's, that's the way we operate. And here's a woman, woman, already they're thinking bad. Canaanite, bad. Demon-possessed child, bad. Her, she's bad, not, not the child, the mother. That's the focus. Uh, so, but she's persistent. So she, the mother, pr approaches Jesus again. And the crowd grumbles even more, thinking that, you know, she's that kind of mother. And um, she tries, she throws herself at his feet. She knelt before him, Lord, help me. And then that's when he calls her a dog. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Um, and um, then she says, yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So um, what Jesus says as he rebuffs her is, I was sent to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And uh, he's saying, I, I'm here for the in-group, for my group, for my people. And they, those are Jews. I'm here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's why I'm here, my in-group. And this woman throws herself at her feet and shakes him, tells him um, this, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She's talking about Jesus' master. She's talking about God. And she's telling Jesus that, God cares for everybody, even the, what you call the dogs. I, I don't know how this works exactly. I, I think we all want to restrict love to people who are in our group. We do it. We all do it to people who are in our group. And, um, and Jesus did it too, it looks like. Um, so I, this is what I write. This story is a puzzle. I don't know if Jesus learned at that moment that God's love was not restricted to the children of Israel. I don't know if this woman caused him to realize for the first time the pain of human prejudice and the powerlessness of outsiders. After all, he was born a baby and must have learned these things at some time through some sort of experience. But we don't tend to think of Jesus learning at all. And we mostly ignore that he was a human. And we, we Christians, think of him that way. Jesus is God in the flesh. We forget that he was fully God and fully human. As a human, he spoke a specific language, took on a specific culture's habits, and was inculcated in that culture's values. Perhaps he too, like us, needed to unlearn cultural prejudices and tribalism, our natural tendency to hang out with people like ourselves and to exclude the outsider, people who are different. Perhaps he had to learn that there is no circumscribing the love of God that the borders of God's kingdom extend beyond Israel, and that even dogs, cultural outsiders and the dispossessed, get the crumbs off the table. Perhaps God used the Syrophoenician woman to teach Jesus to burst the bounds of finite human exclusionary love. Perhaps, regardless of how Jesus learned it, we can learn from this story that there are no bounds to the love of God. God does not restrict his love to the children of Israel, nor does he his restrict, restrict his love to followers of Jesus. The master's table is set for everyone. So I think the whole thrust of the Gospels um, is um, radical, inclusive love. 
And, um, and Jesus learned it from that point on in that gospel, the love and justice are to be extended to everybody. It's to go out, love and justice are to go out to everybody, not just Israel. That's the whole point of that gospel. I don't know how he learned it, um, but in that gospel, that's the message. And followers of Jesus then are required to go out and not be tribal, not to constrict their love, um, not to only care for people who are in group. I, I wrote something recently about Christians. Jesus, by the way, didn't consider himself a Christian. Uh, he thought he was a follower of the way of God. And the way of God is the way of peace and the way of compassion. That's the way of God. So if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you follow the way of God. Um, that's what a Christian is. If Christians now say that um, by virtue of being Christians, um, immigrants can't come in, if Christians now understand Christianity be to, to be really, really deeply tribal um, and to be Islamophobic and uh, anti-Semitic, um, actually anti-anybody with brown skin. Um, Mexicans coming up from the border, there's prejudice against black people, there's Islamophobia, anyone who doesn't look like they're in their tribe. If that's how they understand Christianity, they can have that name, Christianity. I don't need it. They can have it. They can call that Christianity. It has nothing to do with Jesus. Call it whatever you want. Jesus wasn't a Christian. Not, not like that. Um, this is what Christianity is. I think this is what following Jesus means. And so I'm writing to people who want to follow Jesus. And uh, I don't make political points in the book. I'm not scoring points. I'm just trying to show to Christians what it is um, Jesus is calling them to do. And what he's calling them to do is to break the bounds of tribalism and, and to love everyone and to seek peace on earth and goodwill to all people. Okay, this is the group thing. Oh, so here's what we're going to do. Um, we often come and meet in these things, but we don't actually talk to anybody um, who's different from us. Uh, today we did it with the students. They all, all the students sat together, and then there, but there were people from all over the world today, and not just from all over the world. There are people with really different beliefs from yours. I found out uh, he left. <laughs> uh, somebody was a uh, practitioner of the Sikh religion, and uh, but he's gone. There are people who are really different from you uh, who are in this room. If you're from a country outside the U.S., would you mind putting your hand up? Basil, will you put yours up? Basil, will you put yours up? Because we're going to run out of people here quickly. So where are you from? Nigeria. 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 Pakistan. Pakistan. Uh, Japan. Japan. Guatemala. Guatemala. Okay, so there's people from different countries. If, if you identify as a Christian, put your hand up. All right. It, so look, oh, everyone has to look around. It's okay. It's okay. If you identify as a Muslim... Okay, you're going to get a lot of attention today. This is good. <laughs> if you identify as a Jew, put your hand up. If you identify as a, you know, none, atheist, any, no one does here. Maybe one. Okay, so hands go up. All right, um, so we've got different uh, people from different parts of the, of the world. We have people with different religious beliefs. And it would be a terrible missed opportunity if you didn't uh, meet and talk with someone who is different from you. And so what I want you to do is to do that, and you're going to ask them just uh, two questions. You're going to, and what you have to do is meet them and greet them. And um, I, sometimes when you go and greet, I, I do most of my work now in Muslim majority countries, and, and uh, a lot of women, a lot of guys do this, don't we? We do this, no problem, but you go to a woman and they, and then you have to quickly go like this. And, and, and I feel like I made such a mistake. And the, the fact is when you do these things, you're going to make mistakes. And, um, and then I like to ask people questions. I ask a lot of questions, sometimes too many. And, and you know, the, the great thing is people who are different from me have let me know. I've learned from my mistakes. 
we're so liable to make mistakes when we're having conversations from, with people who are different from us. Biggest mistake is not to listen. So you're going to ask the other person, uh, or you're going to tell the other person, who am I? And um, I think this is worth doing. I do, I do this with my students. I have them write down 10 things. So think of 10 things that you might tell them, who am I? I don't tell them we're going to do this. But if I do this, sometimes I'll have them write down 10 things. Who am I? I just have them list. Who am I? And even though, like, if, where I teach most in West Michigan, most of the students are Christians. None of them write that first. It's always like fourth or fifth or seventh. Somebody, there's always somebody. Uh, the most holier than thou person. Christian, that's first. You know, the one that wants everyone to know they're the most religious. Somebody always does it first, but everyone else, uh, there are a lot of things that define who we are. And we may think that our religion is the most important thing, Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but th think of about 10 things. You, you have a lot of things, a lot of identities. You have multiple identities. Now, here's the interesting, so I use it to show this. When you read something in the newspaper about somebody whose skin is different colors from yours, what do you think is the most important thing about them? Muslim. Religion jumps right to the top. Muslim, that's what motivated them. Not an, not a, an attack to themselves not out of fear for themselves, out of fear for their kin or fear for their tribe. They attacked because they were Muslim religion. So it's worth asking people, who are you? So think of your list, maybe 10 things. Who am I? And then just sit and listen. Um, and then, then you can, I want you to talk about your religious beliefs, but I want you to listen. And, you, and when I do interfaith things, I never let anybody tell anybody else what they believe. They don't, they don't get to say, don't you believe? Uh, I gave this example uh, earlier today, and I'll use it with you because you're, uh, I, this group that I did, I worked with for a year, um, Muslim, Christian, Jews from all over the world, academic, highly educated, and as bigoted as anybody else in the world. And so we had really big Islamophobia issues, and we had big uh, anti-Semitism issues in the group. And... Because the group got familiar, because we got to like each other better, do you mind standing up? One of the uh, Jewish members of the group walked up to one of the Muslims, and he, he felt like he could ask this. He said, you want to kill me, don't you? Thank you. You can sit down. <laughs> and it was a great moment because the Muslim was so gracious in response. And if people think that, you know, the, the question needs to be asked. Uh, we're, we, all, we all have prejudices and biases, and if we don't say them, we don't put a name on them, uh, well, they're just going to hide for a while and then come out, you know, every time Trump runs for president or something. So anyway, you can ask them about their religion and just listen. Don't tell them what they believe. But then maybe you can ask a question. You can ask a question, but you can't tell them what they believe. And then I want to ask... Uh, this and then I, I, I want to read this. I want you to tell them this. Um, lots of times we think when we do this, when I when I go around and give this talk, everyone wants to know like, what about Israel and Palestine? Um, I, I'm with a Jew. Uh, Aziz is from. Uh, my Jewish partner is from Philadelphia, an American. Aziz is Arab who grew up in Israel. And so everyone wants to know about Israel-Palestine. And to me, Israel-Palestine is a dodge for most of us because it's a place where we can, most academics look down on Jews there um, and most really look down on Muslims just sort of in general. And uh, it's a way for people to feel superior about themselves. But as I said before, no one kills more innocent people around the world than the United States. And we, we face... Um, prejudice in the U.S. more openly now than we have, I think, in 20 years. We have our own problems. Israel-Palestine isn't our problem. Uh, it's not a non-problem. It's something we need to take seriously, but it, it becomes an excuse for us not to do anything. Our psychic energy is spent feeling superior to Isra Is Israeli Jews and to Palestinian Muslims 
by the way, it's not about Judaism and Israel. It has nothing to do with Judaism and Israel. It has everything to do with the land. Um, that's why people are fighting. I read this from Obama t today. Um, so Obama, this is a quote from Obama talking about the effect of social media on young people. Like if I tweet or hashtag about how you didn't do something, didn't do something right or use the wrong verb, then I can sit back and feel pretty good about myself because, man, did you see how woke I was? I called you out. The world is messy, Obama said. There are ambiguities. People who really do really good stuff have flaws. People who are fighting may love their kids and, you know, share certain things with you. That is not activism. That is not bringing about change. If all you're doing is casting stones, you're probably not going to get that far. Now, we hear about what's going on and, and what we can do sometimes is to feel like we're, we're better than those people in Nigeria who are all bickering all the time. We're better than those Israel Palestinians. We're better than, or whatever, and, and we're not. And so I, I want you to think like, what can I do in my community um, to make, to make the world, how can I bring peace and compassion to my community? What, what can I do? And I don't mean in the U.S. I mean in the Bronx or your neighborhood or your, your next door neighbor. Lots of times now we don't even know our next door neighbor because they're not in our tribe. Um, what can you do, what can you do where you are to bring peace and compassion to the world? So go, so everyone has to stand up. You have to go and you have to meet someone you don't know, all phones away. No phones, you have to meet. Maybe let's do this in groups of three or four to make it less awkward. You have to greet the people. You have to tell them who you are. Ask them about their religion. Hey, the students need to leave. I want to read one last thing for people to take with them uh, in the book. And this is my hope. Uh, I hope that all of you, so uh, you, one thing you find out when you go through Who Am I is we're not that different. And I, I find when I go around the world now that um, Muslims want the th same things I want. They, they want to live in peace. They want a better life for their children. Um, and they don't want to live uh, in war. And um, so I, I'm going to read one last um, piece here, and then we'll, uh, the students need to leave. So um, I stand on the beach and watch the rushing water seek all, out all the low places. Its wriggling fingers reach out to find and fill empty spaces. Its reach exhausted, another wave follows and fills those empty places. And another. There are always more, more than enough. Abundance. I want to expend, extend my arms in grace and mercy to find and fill the world's empty spaces. When compassion and joy fill in the holes, the cracks and crevices, the nooks and crannies and hidden places, peace and harmony overflow with the rightness of the world. Thanks for coming.